Um, all right, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, welcome to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is our usual Sunday night uh, sutra study group. Uh, for a number of weeks now, in, in, incalculable by, by my standards, uh, we've been doing a study of this beautiful Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra, the Bodhisattva inexhaustible intellect or inexhaustible mind. And I, I think I said this maybe last week or whenever, but you know, we've, we've gone inexhaustible. At, the, at this point, it could just keep going and going and going, and we could be on this sutra forever. It, it's actually what the, the sutra lends itself to an infinite Dharma talk, uh, which is beautiful. We've been uh, di discussing it for a while now, many, many weeks. We've been discussing these 10 paramitas, the, the 10 paramitas. Uh, and we've, we're six in now. We just discussed our pranya, the pranya paramita, the perfection of wisdom or transcendent wisdom. That was all last week. And tonight we sort of were starting the seventh paramita, the paramita of upaya. And tonight you might have noticed, I don't, I haven't written anything on the board. And that's for a reason. This, I, I almost want to say that this is not, we're not doing Upaya tonight. I almost want to say, right? This is really because of the special, unique nature of this idea of Upaya. And, and this Paramita, the Upaya Paramita, the perfection of skillful means, the perfection of skillfulness. It's such a unique, special idea that we need to stop everything we're doing and, and just talk about Upaya for a moment. And so I don't even know, I don't know if we're even gonna get to Upaya tonight. I think we're just gonna be talking about it and kind of getting a feel for it in that way. Um, of course, anybody who's, familiar with Upaya knows I'm, I'm, I'm being funny, of course, but this is going to be that kind of a night. It's going to be a funny night. Um, we're, again, we're just going to be talking about an idea. And it, it you know, if, if you've been coming, so you know, you know, the Bodhisattva Akshayamati has asked the Buddha about enlightenment. What does it mean to be enlightened? How does one get enlightened? How does one attain Anuttara Samyak somebody supreme unsurpassable enlightenment? That's the question. And the Buddha's answer is, well, the Bodhisattva practices, uh, cultivates, works on, is interested in, considers foremost, however you want to word it. But the Bodhisattva is interested in these 10 dharmas, paramitas, excellences, again, qualities. It's hard to translate these ideas, the idea of a paramita in that way. But where I want to start tonight, and it's, it's why tonight's special, you know, it's that these 10 paramitas, they're, they're truly sort of what constitute the bodhisattva path, the, the process of the path, the way the path unfolds. And the bodhisattva path is a, it's a unique, special path within Buddhism. And that's sort of where we're going to be kind of thinking about, we're going to be thinking about this idea of the Bodhisattva path. And in particular, of course, Mahayana Buddhism, we're going to be thinking about that and contrasting it a little bit as I kind of usually do. And it's not, it's not me. <laughs> it's the sutras, the sutras themselves contrast themselves with an earlier practice. They call it the Shravakayana, the voice hearer path. You could think of it as the Arhat path. You could think of it as the uh, kind of old school renunciatory uh, monastic Buddhism. You know, the very um, 
uh, the, it's, you know, it's the path of the eightfold path and liberation of oneself from suffering. That's, that's the original path. And these paramitas, well, these part, all 10 of these ideas, they come up in the earliest of Buddhist traditions, in, in, in the Pali suttas. These 10 ideas come up. And in particular, the first six, the first six of these paramitas come up a lot. Giving or, you know, uh, dana as it's called, shila, moral discipline is like top of the top of the list, really. Patience, determination, meditation, wisdom. These are ideas that are very, very present in all forms of Buddhism. But structured this particular way, in this particular order, this starts to constitute the bodhisattva path, which is different than the Shravaka Yana voice hearer path. It's different than the earliest Buddhist tradition. And tonight is very much about what makes the bodhisattva path a little different, if not very different than that early type of Buddhism. And there's, so this, this paramita of upaya, what is translated as skillful means, that's the usual standard translation of upaya, skillful means, skillfulness. I've seen uh, in the, the standard English translation of the sutra that we're doing, they translate it as ingenuity, ingenuity, cleverness. I've seen cleverness. You know, the Chinese, which I, I have it, I have at least that much on, on the board. The Chinese is this uh, two character combination, Fang Bian, Fang Bian. And it's interesting because Fang Bian in modern Mandarin, which is the pronunciation I'm using, Fang Bian, it means um, convenience, like a, even like a convenience store or like a convention. We would, we could, you know, talk about uh, money as a convenience or a convention. Uh, you could even get into thinking about language as a convention. Uh, dating, uh, dating systems are conventions, right? Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different conventions. And the idea of a convention or a convenience, like a convenience store, is the idea that it's it's a little easier. It's a little easier that it's more convenient that way. It's interesting that the Chinese, you know, this idea of feng bian, the uh, convenience, conveyance, right? It's a very interesting idea, and that's what we're going to be sort of talking about tonight. But I want to get back to my original point, which is that this upaya, it's really, really this it's really what separates Mahayana Buddhism and the Bodhisattva path from everything else, meaning the earlier stuff. And I'm going to, I want to talk about why that is. And tonight is definitely, by the way, one of those nights that if you have questions, and I don't just mean questions about Upaya, right? I don't just mean questions about Buddhism. If you've got questions, tonight's the night to, to ask questions, okay? Because tonight's about Upaya. So if you've got questions, we got answers. So please, at any point, just, you know, do whatever has to happen to make, you know, to make your question heard. But I'm going to start us off just to kind of get us going with this, like, what makes this upaya so unique or so special? And I think really spending a moment thinking about it and talking about it will really highlight a lot of ideas. So first of all, let's let's get to the bottom of this. <laughs> upaya, that's a Sanskrit word. The Chinese call it feng bian. We translate it as skillful means, skillfulness, cleverness, ingenuity, convenience, convention. What are we what are we talking about? Especially, what are we talking about within the context of moral discipline, wisdom, giving, patience? what was skillfulness like what exactly are we talking about well 
this is, you know, the beautiful thing about Upaya. It's this beautiful, um, you know, I've been trying to figure out actually if this is a Buddhist idea. I've been trying to find pre-Buddhist examples of this word and this idea within Pali, or not Pali, but within Sanskrit or within the Indian philosophy or milieu. I've been looking to see, is this uniquely a Buddhist idea? I'm not sure that it is, so don't quote me on saying that, but it's definitely an idea that Buddhism in general is into. And, you know, it has everything to do with teaching. It has everything to do with passing on information in that way. We could call it, you know, pedagogy in that sense of like the, the science or even philosophy of teaching in that way. But we are definitely talking about the conveying of knowledge, the passing on, on of knowledge and, you know, for simplicity's sake, teaching. And, you know, um, most of you probably have already heard my two cents on Upaya, but for tonight, I'm going to kind of say it again. You know, upaya, the idea of skillfulness, or again, ingenuity and all these translations, what upaya is, is this very beautiful idea for a teacher's ability to understand who they're talking to, to understand an audience in that sense, and really be able to come up with, you know, it could take a lot of forms. It could be a simile, it could be a metaphor, it could be a joke, it could be a gesture, it could be actually, it actually, that's part of the mystery of Upaya is that it has no established content or form. Again, it could be a joke or it could be a simile, a metaphor, but the idea of Upaya is that it is a skillful means of presenting an idea or some information to a, a student, to a learner. And it's done in such a skillful way that the, the student or the listener, the learner learns, <laughs> understands something. Of course, you know, I'm a big fan of flipping it. So like, let's flip it and think about, well, what's not skillful? Skillful, of course, is a teacher who is speaking some arcane language that the students don't even understand, and they're operating at some really highfalutin level, and then sitting there going, don't you get it? Don't you get it? <laughs> That's not skillful. That it's not skillful. <laughs> it's not upaya, anything like that. So we're dealing with this sort of subtle art of teaching, conveying, passing on knowledge in that way. And, and right from the beginning, I want to say that I believe, you know, I'm a really big, um, not just fan like of Upaya, I'm like a fanboy of Upaya, frankly, but I'm not just like a big proponent of this idea. Like, I think it's a, just a really, really profound idea, which is to speak about the art of teaching, but again, without any particular form that it might take. And that's the very idea of Upaya. In fact, if you know your Vimalakirti Sutra, the most Upayak thing might be to not say anything at all. You, right? And so that's the subtle nature of Upaya, that it's this, you never know what it's going to look like. You never know what it's going to be. It's truly in, in Buddhist, you know, true to Buddhist form, it's a dependently originated phenomena that happens in the in-between. And so, you know, it's sort of like one of those things that's hard to describe in that way. So that's just a little, like a, a, a touch, a flavor of Upaya, that it definitely has to do with sort of teaching or passing on information and knowledge. You can't really point your finger at it, but you know it. You know it when it happens. That's the main thing about Upaya is that on the receiving end, on the learner end, it, it's, it's about um, little epiphanies, little aha moments, little 
oh, I, I got it. Like, I got what you were trying to tell me. So that's upaya on the receiving end. And, you know, on the giving, on the, on the sort of teaching end of it, it's even more mysterious because you really don't know. You, it's really tricky on that end, you know? So somebody like myself that, that is a teacher, and we're, all tr we're trying our best. And sometimes we don't even actually know what has been upayak in that way, which, which is kind of interesting. And, and that actually reminds me, I want to say this too, you know, upaya traditionally, if you were to go back to like your, um, go back to your poly dictionary and look up upaya and look up all the references, upaya is, that is the provenance of the Buddha. The Buddha dabbles in upaya. The Buddha is the great teacher. The Buddha is the upaya master in that way. And what I wanted, what I wanted to say is that even though upaya is a, it's a paramita, this you know exalted idea of an excellence or a perfection, and it's traditionally the provenance of the Buddha himself. I actually want to take a step back and, and say, yes, upaya is profound, so profound. But it's also, I think, not as, as like, the thing that I want to say is, is that any teacher teaching anything, a good teacher is known by their upaya whether they're a, a high school band teacher or whether they're a chemistry teacher or a ballet teacher or whatever there is teaching going on, upaya separates good teachers from bad teachers in that way. As far as good teachers that really know their craft or their subject, really are paying attention to their audience and are good teachers in that way. And again, bad teachers are known for not being skillful. They're known for being boring. They're known for being impenetrable in their knowledge in that way. So even though we're gonna be talking tonight about this like, you know, the bodhisattvas and Buddhas and all of that, I don't wanna keep it at this really high register of like ultimate enlightenment. It's really not as, it doesn't need to be at that register. It's a very like common thing that's happening a, a, a lot in that way, if you look at it the right way, okay? Any questions, ideas, comments about Upaya before we really dive into this? We feeling good? Sweet. Okay, so here's the, here's the main like idea for tonight as far as like Upaya, and Bodhisattva Mahayana Buddhism. Right, you, right away, you might've already picked up the little breadcrumb trail that I was laying out, which is that it's interesting that this is a, that this upaya is a, a practice or a quality or a paramita that the Bodhisattva is working on. And what I mean is, is that well, originally in the uh, old school Pali based tradition, you might call it Theravada. That's one of the versions of this early program of Buddhism. Basically, the idea is, is that a, a voice hearer, a Shravaka, one of doing that path, they were not in the business of teaching, they were in the business of meditating. They were in the business of alleviating their suffering. They were in the business of studying the Dharma to alleviate their suffering. And if they reached a certain point of the alleviation of their own suffering, they were considered this kind of noble, worthy, arhat being. But that's the path. That, or that was the early path. There was no, in early Buddhism, there is no um what's what's the word i'm looking for there's no um suggestion or uh, certainly no mandate that you go out and teach this to anybody that actually wasn't what this was about there was the the buddha the great teacher 
who said all the Dharma and you could study the Dharma, benefit from it and become uh, an arhat, a liberated being in Nirvana without suffering. And one of the things, of course, that if, if you've been, you know, you're a regular Dharma doors uh, attendee here, you know that there's this kind of subtle tension between that early path that was sort of seemingly good for the person doing it, but that's about it, versus this bodhisattva Mahayana stuff, which is much more socially engaged. And, and even though that term socially engaged Buddhism is kind of a modern term, Mahayana Buddhism is socially engaged. That's exactly what we're talking about here with this idea of upaya, is that to, to, to even be thinking about expedient means and skillful means, it, that's predicated on, it assumes that you're doing some sort of social engagement with this dharma. You're not just literally just sitting on it in that way. And, and that right there, like, oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. You're right, that, that, that upaya is this socially engaged practice. And of course, dana, giving, is a socially engaged practice, but that's why dana is the first paramita. That's why dana is the first thing that the bodhisattva practices, is that social engagement. And the way that, of course, I've been teaching these paramitas is that like Shila, moral discipline, the idea within the Mahayana tradition is that one is morally disciplined, not to purify one's karma, not to improve one's rebirth situation and to become a non-returner arhat. It wasn't, you didn't practice moral discipline to, for this, the Bodhisattva practices moral discipline for all of our benefit. Because if one is honest in their speech, it's beneficial to all beings. If one is nonviolent with their body, that's beneficial to all beings. And so there's just this subtle shift in the bodhisattva path where even though these are very classic Buddhist virtues or Buddhist dharmas, Buddhist practices, the focus is in this social engagement. If you remember when we talked about patience, it wasn't just about one's ability to sit still and be patient because that's a virtue for oneself. This kushanti, the, the uh, paramita of patience, it was about enduring other people's nonsense, about enduring other people's hate and not, uh, and not giving hate back to them. So even the kushanti practice was a social engaged practice virya or drive if you read if you read mahayana sutras that talk about the drive that talk about determination for the bodhisattva the reason why a bodhisattva is driven or determined it's often to to how can i put this it's often to encourage others it's like, it's not about me getting my business done. If I'm a good bodhisattva, there's nowhere to go. There's nothing to do here. There's nothing to get done. I don't need to be driven to complete anything. But the drive or the determination is kind of a morale booster for everybody that encounters the bodhisattva. And so the bodhisattva practices drive or determination. Even meditation within the bodhisattva path is not to... Um, to work on my mind and work on my problems and all of that. The, the bodhisattva practice is dhyana meditation to realize there's no self, to like totally get over the self in that way. So even the practice of meditation and then certainly the practice of pranya or this wisdom we talked about last week, it has very little to do with one, one's own benefit, right? We were over that with step one, because we didn't just give, we didn't, if, if you remember that lesson way back, the Bodhisattva's dana, it's not giving money, giving gifts. It's not even giving uh, nuggets of wisdom and knowledge. The Bodhisattva gives it up. In it's a, remember, I, I remember, 
It's a disposition of giving entirely, which is the opposite of any kind of, you know, oh, this will be good for me. This will benefit me looking out for me. Now the Bodhisattva is in this like constant state of, of generosity. So that's the Bodhisattva is a social engaged situation from the beginning. But I, I got to tell you, though, even within all of these sutras, this one, not so much. This one doesn't do it. But most of these sutras, they will, they'll kind of, let's see, where is it? They kind of draw a line between the first six paramitas and these next four. And what I mean by that is, is that the Bodhisattva, when the Bodhisattva embarks on the, the, the great vehicle, right? The Mahayana, there's this way in which they actually are sort of advised, or it's just the, it's the information they're giving in, given in the beginning. They're advised to work on these first six. And there's kind of a thing going on where you kind of have to get your own house in order before you're really ready to start kind of teaching or passing this information on in that way. And so there is this kind of, um, um, how can I put it, like a turning point when you reach this seventh paramita of upaya. There's a certain kind of, in, in certain sutras, they will actually use the language of empowerment. There's a certain empowerment in this. And of course, the, the, the eighth paramita that we're going to talk about is power bala itself. So that's kind of interesting. But I just want you to know that there is this sense that, you know, if, if you've heard about Dharma, you've heard about Mahayana Buddhism, you've heard about this very noble step of vowing to mature all sentient beings in that way this very altruistic move if you're if you're there if you're like you know what i know about improving my mind in the old school buddhist path but i've also heard about this incredibly powerful uh move of altruism that the bodhisattva is involved in like i'm in i i, I kind of think that that's the move that's called the initial determination for enlightenment within the Mahayana tradition. And it's actually a very special moment in a sentient being. In some traditions, they say only humans are capable of this, by the way. I don't know if I believe that, but I just want you to know. But it's a very special moment in that human development or sentient beings development when they actually you know, I don't know if it's the reptilian brain or whatever people talk about, where it's the more primordial brain that's more self-preserving, more angry, more prone to this kind of protectionism. Well, there's this moment when altruism kicks in. There's this moment where you realize that it's not only like very cool <laughs> it's like totally cool to be like generous and altruistic in the way in that way there's a moment when you realize that it's not only really cool it's actually in my best interest as well and it's actually takes it takes um larger vision than the reptilian brain that's very you know protection that reptilian brain or whatever you want to think of it, that kind of self, like, must protect the self, must protect my stuff. That brain that does that is convinced that that's the best move. And it's a very short-sighted move because it, it might get you through the night in that way. But this life thing is a kind of a long-term game in that way. And there's this realization of like, oh, wow, like, if I'm actually generous and altruistic in that bodhisattva way, it doesn't just benefit the, the everybody else. It ultimately is my best move too. 
And that again is the initial determination for enlightenment. When you realize that, when you're like, oh yeah, that actually makes more sense in a bunch of different ways, like logically and in the heart space and in my stomach and all kinds of ways. It's like, yeah, that's the move. Having that initial determination is what puts one on the bodhisattva path. But then the idea is, is that then you work on these six paramitas and then, and by the way, of course, there's no hard written rules to this stuff. It could be that day. It could be the next day. I don't know. It's not like that. But what I mean is, is that there's a kind of a maturation process in which the, then the bodhisattva is then ready to enact some upaya. And, and I think many of you, I know, I know most of you, I'm looking at everybody in here and it's like, I know most of you, you want to pass this information on to people, you know, you probably, whether, you know, whatever little piece of this Dharma that you love, I'm sure at some point you've wanted to pass it on to somebody and you might have dug into your little bag of tricks and found an upaya or found a skillful way to put it to somebody. And it's a beautiful moment, you know, because, you know, as a, as a teacher that, you know, I've been teaching for a, a long time now, and they really, this, the saying, there's a saying, which is that you never really know something until you teach it. It's so true. Like you, you really, really, really have to know your, your business before you have any business uh, passing it on in that way. And, and again, that's the maturation process of the bodhisattva where they're really thinking about this stuff, whether it's thinking about any of these paramitas or even this profound idea of emptiness and pranya wisdom that develops from that understanding of emptiness, there reaches that point where you do get it. You totally get it. And you can then even figure out a way to explain it to your friend. And it's like, who, you know, they're a juggler and you're like, oh, so it's like juggling and it's like, you know, but whatever it is, the idea is, is that it, it, there's just a moment in the bodhisattva development where they kind of pass over into the upaya arts, as it were, right? And again, it can begin with just the, your first, your first passing on some information to a friend until pretty soon you're teaching the, the Bodhisattva Inexhaustible Sutra for weeks on end, you know, so. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pause. Questions, answer, ideas, comments about Upaya, this beautiful idea. Nothing. Fair enough. Okay. I have yep. a question. Great. Um, does it, it seems to me that you, you can sort of deploy a lot of these things skillfully, uh, like, I don't know, you can be patient at the right moment with someone who, who's in need or <laughs> Just that as an example, and and I'm wondering if upaya is is limited to skillfulness in teaching, or if it's kind of broader than that. That just when you skillfully use what you have learned, whether you're sort of <clears throat> officially teaching it or not, if that counts as a whole. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> a, a great question. It. it fully two, two very important things that I, I should have said. So the first part of, uh, to answer your question, I've been leaning into the upaya of, which is more about teaching and passing on information in that way. But I don't want to forget about a very important aspect of upaya. You know, and I mentioned this, of course, at the, at the top of this uh, Dharma talk, which is that, you know, upaya has a lot to do with knowing who you're talking to, knowing your audience in that way. And, and so part of, a big part of upaya is compassion in that way. And so what I mean, Noam, is that 
what your question reminded me like, okay, yeah, it's Upaya is about passing on the Dharma or teaching in that way, but it's also very much about compassion and skillfulness in almost in a nonviolent speech kind of a way. And so there's, you know, there's a way that I'm so heady, I'm so like such a heady philosopher that I kind of always gravitate towards that type of, yeah, must pass on the Dharma, must pass on the Dharma. But there is a deeper, um, another deep import importance to this, which is that this skillfulness is about interrelationship and being kind and compassionate and skillful in that way. And, and, you know, this has a lot to do with, you know, you even, you know, you think about, um, you know, think about, you know, think about having to convey some very hard, uh, so, uh, no, something to somebody, a very hard message, something bad's happened or whatever, some really heavy information that you need to tell somebody. And you could be really blunt and very callous and very violent about that or you could be skillful and you could be delicate and careful. That's upaya too. And so thanks Noam, because yeah, don't leave me out into uh, that, yeah, to whatever Bill <laughs> and bringing it back down. Cause this is very much about upaya in that way. Um, that type of, again, interrelation, skillfulness and compassion in that way. The second thing you said, though, that I, I want to mention, too, and it's actually part of why I'm attempting to do this funny Dharma talk about Upaya, and it's because, yes, all of this is Upaya. All the Uparamitas is Upaya. Talking about giving is Upaya. Uh, put, drawing a whiteboard with all this stuff is Upaya. It's like, yes, it's not a column. It is not just one column among 10 and, and like that. Upaya is so mysterious because it is all of this in that way, right? <laughs> it kind of like encapsulates the whole thing in that way. So thank you, Noam, for that, in that way that giving is certainly, well, you know, this is where they all start to work together too, that if you really want to be a good giver, some upaya really helps in that way. Moral discipline, upaya definitely helps with that, especially if you want to avoid um, self-flagellation and, and uh, uh, you know, self-debasement in that way. <laughs> Um, Michael, I have a quick question. Um, yeah. What about tools uh, such as um, mandalas and um, Buddhist symbols? How would you bring them in the context of upaya? Because for me, it seems like they are tools for upaya or they are upaya themselves, or I don't know. They are upaya themselves, absolutely. And so now, Connie, thank you for saving me from not keeping upaya entirely within the realm of the intellect. Thank you, Noam, for allowing me not to keep it out of the heart space. And yes, Gani, absolutely. It's not just words or things like that. It, you know, sutras themselves, of course, but definitely aids and tools and guides like mandalas, mantras. And again, it just becomes everything in that way. But you can't really say that because that's not upaya. And what I mean by that is, is that it's, it's actually only upaya when it works. And so the point, Connie, is that let's say you were, you know, you, you know, every, I love those um, like a new age crystal shop man, I, I'm not being facetious or anything. I love new age crystal shops. I'd spend all day, you know, in all the sections and the sage. Oh, I love it. I really, I really mean that. So imagine you're going through one of these new age crystal shops and there's a mandala there and I don't, you're just drawn to it. And it's got Bodhisattva, whoever in the middle, and there's something that just totally clicks 
and it makes you feel much more peaceful and at ease. And you're like, you know what? And you, 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 you purchase it and take it home. And it's like, it's just resonating with you. That's Upaya. And yes, Connie, then the, that mandala image would be Upayak, skillful for you. But it doesn't mean mandalas are Upaya because that might not. So basically, Upaya is an, an action itself, right? It's action. It's a verb rather than uh, um, nomen. nomen. Yep. Nomen. Yeah, now and then that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Sound, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's a verb in the same way that most of these are kind of verbs. Giving is a verb um, insofar as not committing false speech. That's a verb like all that. So anything in moral discipline is kind of verby in that way. Patience is kind of verb, verbal or verby. Um, all of these are kind of verbal, or ver verby, that word, verby, <laughs> this is weird, but our actions that way, but there's also, you know, at the same time, there's something very magical about Upaya. It's totally indescribable, indescript, it's so, it's like love, and I don't want to get cheesy, you know, but it's like love, where it's like, you don't know what you know how love's going to work and why it works but you know it when you feel it you know it when it's happening and it's kind of a that kind of a thing so it's it's it is a verb in the same way that love is loving and is a verb that way but um i just want you to kind of and i think you do connie but i want you to see the the beautiful interacted even if it's a mandala and a person and not a teacher student there's still this beautiful interactivity or dependent origination thing to this that's it's very buddhist beautiful thank you oh, thank you thank you any other questions comments ideas you know <clears throat> on that note it makes me think of two um two things one is the the zen uh, the classic zen story to illustrate this idea of upaya and in particular what I was just saying. So there's a very, very famous uh, Zen, he's a Chinese uh, Zen master, so he'd be a Chan, Chan master, named Ma Tzu. And Ma Tzu is very famous for, well, you know, like a Zen master, or a Chan master is very famous for his unorthodox uh, behavior, let's put it that way, right? Um, and he's in particular, there was this famous moment in which the student came to Matsu and asked, what is Buddha nature? And Matsu's reaction was, ha! Mm -hmm. That was his answer. That's, that was his answer. And, and it was like, whoa. And I, and I spared you. It's usually much louder, much more um, shocking. And that's its intention to be kind of shocking like that. So, the story goes, that, and that's a kind of a classic Zen story about the, the, the Zen master who shouts as an answer, right? But the, the story, the Upaya story, is about how Matsu, right as he's about to, he knows his, you know, he knows he's, his, it's ending soon. And so he knows he's going to be passing on the Dharma flame. And so he calls all of his, his senior students together. And then he gets his senior most of the senior most students and says, if, if you had to tell everybody what my teaching is, what would you say? And the student very proud stepped back and went, ha! And Matsu shook his head and said, I think my Dharma transmission ends here. And, it, and the idea of that is, is that the upaya was not to shout as an answer. It was upayak in that moment when Matsu did it and the students didn't see it coming. And it was a shock. And the idea is it would shock the student into realizing true Buddha nature by being truly present, not thinking logically, all of these different things. But when it gets reduced down to, ha! The, the rote, you know, idea of this, 
then the idea is no, it's not Upaya anymore, right? And so that's a great Zen story for this idea of that you can't, you can't take the same Upaya next door and, and, and be like, look guys, I got it. Here's, it's like, no, you actually have to be dynamically in the, in the moment. And as I'm saying that, this idea of like so much of Upaya is about being present and in the moment, it makes me think of Noam's question about more of, or my response to Noam's question, which was about that skillfulness is about, it's, you know, the Bodhisattva is trying to be skillful all the time. Every act is trying to be skillful in that way. And that's a very interesting place to be, to be always compassionate, always wise, that. Which reminds me, it's a way, it's a Buddhist way to think of upaya, which is that it's actually about wisdom and compassion working together. That's a key aspect of Upaya. And I think that it's a beautiful way of thinking about the Bodhisattva path and even thinking about Buddhism in, in general, which is the idea that, you know, that you could, you know, you could be really, 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 really smart, but not very compassionate. <laughs> and you could be really, really, really compassionate, but not very wise. And the idea is, is that somebody who's even really wise and really intelligent, but without compassion, totally useless. Somebody in a lab that's like cooking up all kinds of cures for diseases that don't even exist, but they're like, oh, but you know, wouldn't it be crazy if there was a disease that was like this and then I could cure it with this and this and that. It's like, yo, bro, nobody even has any of those diseases. Why are you? So their intellect is off the charts they're even involved in something that is ostensibly about helping, right? Curing disease, but they're so off in the intellect that they're curing diseases that don't even exist. So that's a problem when intellect has no compassion. There's the flip side of that though, is that Buddhism also will talk about sort of the, not the danger per se, but a certain kind of like compassion without wisdom you know, you could wind up, you know, basically just like somebody comes to you and, you know, they, they really just want a hug they, or they just want a conversation. And you're like, hey, here's some stuff. Here's some money. Here's more money. Here's more money. Here's more stuff. Like, what more do you want me to give? I'm being so compassionate here. And that's not being clued in that this person doesn't want your money. They don't want your stuff. They actually just want to talk. And so there's a way that too much compassion without intellect can also be just not dangerous in any way, but a kind of a waste, so to speak. And so what Upaya is, is this very beautiful melding of deep, deep compassion with deep, deep wisdom. And the deeper each of those goes, by the way, I mean, that's heading towards Buddhahood in that way. Right, that the bodhisattva who's practicing both their wisdom and their compassion, there's a certain point where the depth of both of those, the deeper they get, they, you know, it's a real um, feedback loop or something like that, where it really kind of feeds each other. So, all right, so that was uh, the first thing I had to say, and then part A and B of that first thing I had to say. <laughs> Questions about the Zen saying about how Upaya can get petered out. Right, your opaya can like peter out. The, the second thing that I wanted to mention tonight, just because we're kind of talking about this beautiful idea of upaya, again, my main thing here, I'm going to reiterate this because I do think it's a really interesting point to make. It's recognizing that in your in the early Buddhist tradition, there's no there's no space for teaching. There's no space for upaya, particularly in the early Buddhist tradition. Again, keep in mind that upaya in the early Pali-based Buddhist tradition, upaya was the provenance of the Buddha alone. The Buddha was the upaya master. We follow the upaya master. That's for, for this Buddhist, this Mahayana Buddhist tradition, 
for it to start being like, all right, bodhisattvas, get ready, get ready, because you got to start practicing upaya too. That's kind of a radical departure from the early tradition. And again, I don't, um, oh, not again, because I haven't said this the first time yet. Something that's very important about this is that there's this language in English about bodhisattvas saving all sentient beings. And that's not, and I've said this on many Dharma talks, that's actually not the real language of either Sanskrit or Chinese or, or any of this, the saving sentient beings. It's not about that. I've said before, the language is about maturing sentient beings. And by maturing sentient beings, we mean enriching, educating, making better, healing. It's about that. And I, and I said this at some point when I was talking about this, that you know, a, a bodhisattva walks by a plant that clearly needs water. The bodhisattva gives the plant water because the bodhisattva notices that the plant needs water. So the bodhisattva is cultivating or maturing a sentient being. Some people walk either walk right by the plant, not noticing that it needs water or mindlessly step on the plant because they actually are so in just on their own zone, in their own world in that way, that the plant, whatever they just stepped on, bug even that they just stepped on is pretty insignificant to what they're doing. The bodhisattva is not, that's not their deal. Remember they've made this sort of kind of uh, altruistic vow. And so they're in the business of watering plants. They're in the business of whatever. If it's a hurt animal, they're gonna try to help it out. If it's a person that needs help, they're gonna try to help the best way they can. And that's where upaya comes in, the best way they can. And this actually affords me another great opportunity to talk about this idea of upaya has a lot to do with what is within my capability, that's also an aspect of skillfulness, if that makes sense. That makes sense that as it, as you know, that I, I kind of, it's to the best of my ability. I'm not trying to go outside of my ability in that way. I kind of know my ability and I'm working within the best of it in that way. And that's certainly a bodhisattva practice. There was a second thing coming up. <laughs> so in addition to the beautiful Zen saying, I wanted to mention the Lotus Sutra. I kind of have to mention the Lotus Sutra in the context of a great talk about Upaya, because if you don't know about the beautiful Lotus Sutra, especially this Burton Watson translation, that's really well done. That Sutra is all about Upaya. It's just one big upaya. It's a big upaya fest. And so if this Dharma talk or this idea of upaya intrigues you at all, then that's the source, the, the Lotus Sutra. That's the source for this idea of upaya. Um, it's a beautiful sutra. Um, again, that it is both about upaya and it's full of upaya usually in the form of similes, parables, and metaphors, and things like that, so. Okay, everybody doing okay? Nice half hour left or so, cool. So I am then, even though I didn't write anything on the board, I'm gonna dive into the sutra to talk about the very first of, if I had my list up here of 10 practices that the Bodhisattva considers foremost in the practice of Upaya, of these 10, I will talk about the first one. Again, I didn't write it on the board. I didn't know if I'd get this far, but it's very much like, it's, it's right here to be spoken about. And the very, very first of the 10 practices that this sutra talks about is, and let's see, maybe I'll just read from, yeah, again, the standard English translation leaves a lot to be desired. 
they translate it as penetrating, where it's like, eek, yikes, penetrating, must we? Penetrating the mentalities and desires of sentient beings. The, uh, the, my choice would be entering, and that's strictly based on the language that we're provided with in both in the Chinese and the English, entering the minds, mental habits, desires, and joys of sentient beings is a better translation of all the Chinese that it, that's there. And I want to talk, I want to really break this down. So this has a lot to do with powers in particular, this, this uh, very interesting Buddha power, Bodhisattva power. It is this power of reading people's minds. This idea of knowing people's thoughts or minds. This has been a part of Buddhism since day one. I speak on it uh, often. It's sort of like there are these... Um, five, sometimes six superpowers. And we're gonna talk about the superpowers at some point, but there are these traditional five or six superpowers that are, they're basically symptoms of enlightenment. So the idea in Buddhism is that these are things that start to happen to you and they are side effects of the practice. They are symptoms of enlightenment. They're not the goal of this, but they're things that start to happen to you. Increased ear hearing, what is called the divine ear, you start to hear stuff, maybe from uh, like ghostly realms or even things you shouldn't really be able to hear, things at vast distances, divine eye, to be able to see through solid objects, see in far distances things like levitation, passing through solid objects. These are all part of the supernormal powers that come through dhyana, that come through jhanic meditation. One of the six supernormal powers has always been this ability to read people's minds or know people's thoughts. Again, it's supposedly symptomatic of this and it, you know, many people know that when I was in school, what I was studying was uh, Buddhist magic. I was studying Buddhist books of magic spells that were really popular in China. I was studying the um, cultural role of Buddhist monks as wonder workers. They, they had this cultural role in China, medieval China, as wonder workers. They could perform miracles. They could uh, tell fortunes, do all kinds of stuff. So there's a really interesting world of Buddhist magic that I got really into. And of course, telepathy, the idea of reading people's minds, that had, was always part of the discourse in Buddhist magic. And I, of course, always found it very, um, well, interesting, of course. I, I knew from a Buddhist point of view that it was a symptom or a side effect. I knew that the Buddhists were not interested in reading people's minds. They just understood it, it sort of happens that you develop that ability. But it's really only within the last couple of years that I really have come to understand what they're talking about. And I'm not claiming I can read people's minds at all because I'm not an advanced bodhisattva. I definitely am very low level bodhisattva in that way. But I teach it enough and study sutras enough where I'm like, oh, Oh, that's what they're talking about. Oh, that makes way more sense. And so how I understand this Buddhist idea of understanding the minds of sentient beings or understanding the minds of other beings, it has to do with this very simple Buddhist teaching of the three afflictions, the three kleshas, the three poisons. Uh, the three poisons are usually translated as greed, anger and delusion. I'm actually for the three poisons, I'm actually a fan of like attraction, aversion and confusion. It's a little more to what those words moha raga and dvesha mean. It's, it's not, 
the idea is, is that if I'm averse to something, which means I kind of want to move away from it, that aversion can get so extreme that I actually hate. <laughs> so like, it's like, it's aversion on, you know, just ramped up. But the initial affliction, the initial klesha is just aversion. Likewise, similarly, this idea of attraction, it can get to the point where it's wanty, desirous, greedy, and pretty soon you're golem and it's like, my precious, right? But the idea is, is that it starts with just attraction. Ooh, ooh, what's that? So we have, ooh, what's that? Versus mm, like a turning away. And then this idea of delusion or confusion, it's not as heavy as avidya, like ignorance. It's actually just this idea of confusion. It's like it's, it's like when you first wake up in the morning and you're a little groggy. Look, what's going on here? It's like, that's moha. That's the confusion. It's this like, wait, what's going on here? Ooh, ah, what's going on here? So those are the three kleshas. Ooh, ah, what's going on here, right? And again, the idea is, is that attraction can get crazy aversion can get crazy. And indeed, confusion can get crazy. It can get cr literally crazy. The point though, is that those three afflictions, those three movements towards, away, and confused are basically the operating program of all sentient beings. And so if you actually wanna know the mind states and mind and inclinations of any sentient being, you can know that what they're doing is essentially the manifestation of their particular attraction, aversion, and confusion. And so, as I often say, this reading people's minds business, it is not a, a kind of um, that telepathy of like, I know what you're thinking. It's that I know why you're thinking what you're thinking. Because of attraction, aversion, and delusion. And by the way, the idea is that the, the reason why I could know your mind or even like a dog's mind, like what is on a dog's mind? The reason why I could understand a dog or another human's attraction, aversion, and delusion I can understand it because I have attraction, aversion, and delusion. And so if you understand why you like the things you like, don't like the things you like, are confused the way you're confused, and how that is manifesting your reality, that this is sort of a kaleidoscope of your attraction, aversion, and delusion, if you can, through Vipassana insight, if you can sort of understand how that's working, it kind of opens up an understanding to how minds work. Because that's kind of the Dharma here, is that all minds are operating on, ooh, eh, wait, what? Ooh, eh, wait, what? And again, if you think about even like a dog that is like ravenously wants some stuff, barks and is like, get the hell away from me, and is confused, just like all beings, in a, like what's going on here kind of a way. And so there's, if I can, if I may, the idea here is, is that the Bodhisattva course isn't reading people's minds to try to sell them something, you know, or something like that. This is about compassion. This is this deep move of really sympathizing with other people's attraction, aversion, and delusion. Deeply, deeply empathizing. Be again, because you know what it's like to be frustrated, anxious, confused, and all of these things. And so by understanding, oh, we're all going through this like that. Through a compassion, there's this way of understanding 
you know, basically it's about understanding again, not what people are thinking, but why they're thinking what they're thinking, understanding why they're doing what they're doing. And Bodhisattva being compassionate then because of that. Understanding that, it, you know, if somebody's, you know, goes into a store and steals something, the Bodhisattva understands that that's an act of wanting and the wanting is arising from all of the, these things we're talking about and, and doesn't vilify the shoplifter in that way. And, and I could go on and on and on and on and on with real world examples of how this could play out, if you know what I mean. That if you were really sympathetic or empathetic and compassionate towards people and really looking and understanding like, oh, wow, this is an out, you're suffering like I am. You have wants and aversions and delusion like I do. So there's this way that the Bodhisattva, and again, this is just the first uh, on the eight of the 10 steps here, but the first is this understanding the mind's habits, which is to say samskara, by the way, the minds, the mental habits, the desires, and the joys of sentient beings. That's the first one. And a very, very important one on that list, which by the way, sadly, yeah, sadly the English, they left it out. They always do this. You know, I have my problems with this translation, but they, do this weird, the penetrating, which I want to talk about that word in a second, uh, entering or penetrating the mentalities and desires of sentient beings, mentalities and desire. But wait, what about our joys? <laughs> it's, it says our joys. And so in, indeed, there's a lot of other sutras and it might even come up in this one, but the Bodhisattva is also in the business of, of bringing people joy. They're very much in the business of knowing what will delight and, and make people joyful and delivering that. It's part of the, it's part of the business of being a bodhisattva. So, Michael, oh yeah, Connie. I have uh, two quick questions. One question is um, instead of the three clashers, you can summarize them as suffering, right? Um, so if you understand, okay. And then the second thing is just to your note about bringing joy um, to others. I, I um, listened to a, a talk by Adi Shanti yesterday, the day before a live talk, and he took the question they came up like, you know, what is the aspect of suffering in joy? You know, and I've been noticing that myself in my life, whenever I feel joy there, you know, since, you know, a couple of months, you know, I experienced the joy at the same time, I'm very aware of the suffering in the joy, in the sense of, you know, when I think then about impermanence, right? And so um, we often think about impermanence when we think about suffering, right? When I go through a hard time, I'm thinking of like, well, everything in impermanent will change, but we don't like to think about impermanence when, when there is joy. So um, I, I've, what do you, what, what are your thoughts about bringing joy into this world or what you just described or bodhisattvas bringing joy to um, others, even though the joy, if it's not rooted in um, clarity about suffering, basically, and yeah. about the root <clears throat> cause of suffering, then eventually it will bring suffering, right? And so, yes. yeah, what are you, did you have any thoughts around that? Oh, yeah. Uh, too many for 20 minutes, but I'll do, I'll do my best. Yeah. You know what, Connie, what you're voicing that initial, the initial idea you have about the relationship between suffering and joy, you know, that's a very first noble truth statement. And the, you know, the first noble truth of the four noble truths, the first noble truth, this, this bold statement about suffering dukkha and that it's all dukkha. Remember that, that was sort of the initial understanding of the first noble truth was that even the joy that you have that's fleeting, that's dependent on things. Yeah, that's actually dukkha too. That was the Buddha's first, you know, it's the first noble truth, but it's kind of a very heavy idea that, that even the, when you're happy or joyful, it's actually dukkha. 
but I want to, you know, add my bit to that, which is that even in the early Buddhist teachings, they're talking about priti, the rapture, they're talking about ananda, the pleasure, they're talking about the sukha, the bliss, they're talking about those things. And when the Buddha said this thing about the first noble truth and all is dukkha, I believe and I understand that what he was talking about is that if you are getting your joy, your pleasure, or your bliss from this world, the things of this world, you're fooling yourself. So if your joy or your pleasure or your bliss is dependent upon the things in this world, the things in this world are impermanent. And so your joy is impermanent. That was the basic idea. But the Buddha was still talking about rapture and bliss in these meditative states. And as I teach it and understand it and practice it actually, the idea is, is that there is a state of uh, rapture, priti, uh, bliss, sukha, pleasure, ananda, all of these ideas that arise from independence from this world by actually removing oneself from this world and entering essentially into jhanic states, one has a independent pleasure. It's not dependent on anything. And therefore it is kind of an infinite pool in that way. So Connie, that's the first thing about like joy and bliss and Buddhism that I want to mention. Yeah, one How thing that... about this, just a comment to that and what came comes to my mind when you explain, like just elaborate on, on that. Um, the glimpse that I got is like, well, joy itself, um, when we experience joy, it's not necessarily, it's not good nor bad, right? The attachment to the joy is bad right? or not bad, but you know, it, it creates suffering. The joy itself doesn't. So it's always the relation to rather than, yeah. Anyway, that yes. was just super insightful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, the other thing that I wanted to say, which pertains to this idea of knowing, knowing people's habits and their minds and even their joys, I, I wanted to, to re, um, so it's sort of the second part of the thing you said, Connie, that I think was very interesting, uh, or your question, which is about this idea of the Bodhisattva bringing joy. It's very much, um, it's very practical, which Upaya is very practical in that way. It, again, because it's, it's the exercise of upaya is very much about understanding, you know, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, what's going to land, so to speak, what's going to miss the mark, as they say. And so in terms of being very practical, the bodhisattva is very practical in that way. And what I mean, and what, what I believe this uh, sutra is talking about in terms of understanding the joys and all of that, it's, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's like if somebody were, you know, literally, literally very, very, very thirsty. And you were trying to explain something to them, but they're so thirsty that they just, they can't listen. It would be probably the slick move to give them a nice, cool, refreshing glass of water and slake their thirst. And then they're like, oh, what were you saying? Like I can, I can hear you now because I'm not this. I'm not preoccupied with this thirst. In exactly that kind of same way, the reason why the Bodhisattva understands what would make people joyful and then acts on that is a very similar way. In that sense of like, like a nice, cool, refreshing glass of water. If people are too bitter and kind of angry in a way, they might hear the dharma through their bitterness and through their anger and so the bodhisattva move in a way similar to giving that fresh uh, glass of water the bodhisattva sort of would act, move from joy first to kind of bring the spirits up and then act from there so it's kind of an interesting very much in line with this idea of upaya which is this why the bodhisattva would be in the business of knowing people's joys, people's habits in that way. So. Yeah, when we come to close circle, because what plays into that, what you said earlier is like, um, you, you know, uh, upaya is the decision 
of um, or the decision and balance between compassion and wisdom, right? Like wisdom when somebody is very thirsty, um, wisdom would be like, come on, you know, like, be, like more the sharp, you know, coming with wisdom, you know, there is no yeah. thirst or whatever I'm saying, but it doesn't help the person in that moment. So you have to, you know, so this is, yeah, yeah, exactly. it, it makes so much sense. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. So glad. Are there are questions, comments, or ideas. I did want to say something about this curious language of penetrating people's minds. Um, I went with a slightly more gentle entering people's minds, entering the minds and habits and desires and joys of sentient beings. So I, I know many of you might might have been at my uh, talk on Friday night about Buddhism and language. Um, this is sort of along those lines about uh, language, and I think it's kind of just an, a kind of an interesting idea. So the um, and now I kind of wish I would have at least written this one Chinese character on the board. It's so simple. It actually looks like that. It's two lines, looks like that. And actually, if I were to draw it this way, with the line going this way, it would be a picture of a person walking. But if you flip it the other way, it's the Chinese verb, or actually it's not a verb, but it's a Chinese word for to enter. It's very simple. So it's like a person walking and then person entering, very simple. But this word, this very, it's just two strokes, simple dimple. But wow, talk about a word, talk about a word that gets used a lot of different ways. It's being used here. It's, so it's to rule, to enter the minds of sentient beings. But I wanted to share with you kind of just this beautiful, it's a, it's a beautiful way that you could feel maybe what's being said here. And it has to do with, so it's this really, if you were going in Chinese, of course, particularly in like classical poetic Chinese, if you were going to hike up a mountain, they, call, they would call that entering the mountain. And, and that, you know, it's sort of like the way that you would enter a forest or enter a woods or enter a house or enter. There's this way that even though in our grammar and in English thinking, we go up a mountain or we hike up it, this one simple Chinese word to enter the mountain. So like an English person like me or English speaker like me, when I first started learning Chinese and then I, heard, I saw this enter the mountain, I'm thinking dwarf, I'm thinking like dwarves. <laughs> they end, you know, going in. And then it, I kind of had to reprogram my mind in that way of like, oh, it's just this really more broad way of thinking of that, this idea of entering. And so, you know, just like you, again, like you would enter a room, you would enter a mountain, even though you're on top of it in that way. And that, so that's just this very, very simple way to try to convey how this one two stroke, simple Chinese character, it can have a very, very broad meaning. And then you get this thing here where the bodhisattva enters the mind of a sentient being, right? And then that's like really like, whoa, what exactly is that? And well, yeah, we have time. So that sort of, so again, this is the first of 10 steps. We'll talk about the next, uh, the rest of the nine next time. But this first idea of entering a sentient being's mind, and in particular, again, entering the mind, the samskara, meaning the mental habits, the desires, kleshas in that way, and the joys of sentient being. To enter it, it's such an interesting idea. It's a very... Um, I mean, I've already sort of started to dance around it a lot with this idea of um, 
to know the mind of a sentient being is not <clears throat> some sort of mind reading trick. It's more of this, well, basically that you understand Dharma, like deeply, you understand the noble truths, you understand that that's what's kind of causing all of this to happen. But that's, you know, sort of still over here um, as an observer in that way. And this, this deeper idea of entering the mind of a sentient being, I think, again, I want to just sort of like, I want to lean into how empathetic and compassionate the Bodhisattva is here where it's not even, it's like, you know, we have this expression of, of standing in somebody else's shoes, right? It's, it's like that, but like literally, <laughs> like literally standing in their shoes in that way. So this, this verb, this idea of entering the mind of an ascension being is to like really try to empathetically, compassionately enter into that person's space and, and again, for the, the, the reason you would want to do this or, or do it at all is for this upaya thing to happen. That's the idea is like to really empathetically understand where this person's coming from. You know, because a lot of people also, um, you know, they, they uh, have personas and they put up uh, facades and things like that. And so the idea of like really entering where someone's at and really, really empathetically, compassionately appreciating where they're at. And then again, whether it's because you've got something to tell them or you've got something to teach them or something to share or whatever, you know, let, I'll do it again. I, I always love to do this, right? Let's flip it. What does the non bodhisattva, non upaya, person look like, right? It's that person that's so self-absorbed in their own story and in their own situation, right? That they literally, you know, are not listening to the person talking, waiting for them to stop talking so that they can talk. It's like, yeah, that's non-upaya. That's non-compassion. It's not the bodhisattva move, right? And so this is where the Bodhisattva is very much like not just a good listener, because that's only one of six sensory situations, right? <laughs> okay. Questions, answers, comments, ideas about this idea of entering the minds or habits, desires, or joys of sentient beings. Yeah, Tanya. So when you were talking about the the verb and the mountain example, um, I kind of, and I think this is related to then how you were um, talking about it with the bodhisattva but it reminded me i was thinking like well how's that different than like going into a, into a forest and like you know forest you know you've got the trees above you so you sort of feel like you're going into something but when you say you're entering a mountain if you flip it or not flip it like you talk about but if you look at it in a different way it's like you're entering that sort of environment of the mountain you're entering Perfect. so it's not so much like where we say we're entering a woods where it feels more like you're enclosed it's like you're thinking of like more of an environment, like what's going on there. So you could say you're entering the river, the river stream environment or whatever. And so going then to the Bodhisattva, thinking about people, you're kind of like you're entering kind of their environment, like what they're experiencing kind of in a more bigger way. Exactly. Exactly. So perfect. You literally took words out of my mouth that I wanted to, to say, which was that idea of like, it's about entering an environment, like you said. And then when you apply that to a person, it's like entering their environment. And it's like, you know, the it, when you were speaking, actually, Tanya, the image that came to my mind is like, you know, entering into someone's private space, entering into like their room where all of their their vision board is and their their dreams and their hopes are everywhere on the walls. And the Bodhisattva enters that environment compassionately and wants to know like, oh, this is this person's hopes and dreams and this is what they're all about. And, and, and certainly wouldn't 
you know, belittle it or deride it, but it would would be like, oh, they're they're really into, you know, whatever, uh, punk rock, uh, 70s punk rock and this and that and like really enter that environment. And again, with the with the the reason why they want to understand that is to be compassionate and wise in that way. So thanks for for um, for taking the words out of my mouth. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, or ideas about this idea of entering minds, samskaras, desires, or joys? Well, then, um, since I, I won't, we have very little time. So I just want to say one last word then, because we've been, I've mentioned a few times, but didn't speak on it, which is this first move, we enter minds, which is chitta, which is actually more about mind states. If you are deep, deep Dharma student there, we're talking about chitta mind states. And then that second one is about the kleshas, or sorry, 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 samskara, about the, men, the mind habits, habits of the mind, right? And so that's a particularly interesting one, of course, for all Dharma students here, which is understanding, of course, that, uh, well, if you understand your 12 link chain of causation, you know that consciousness itself, what it is that you are thinking about, what it is you are conscious of, is dependent upon that samskara, is dependent upon our conditioning. And in many ways, what it is that we are conscious of is not a world out there, but a conditioned mind in here, so to speak. So conditioning is really deep. It's really, really deep in terms of Buddhism. And, you know, I did all that talking about the three uh, kleshas. And if you understand the three kleshas, just in general, you can kind of understand minds in, in general. Well, it part of that is also this idea of, you know, not the conditioning is any particular way of being conditioned. It's just the idea that we are conditioned that we have conditioned thought patterns, conditioned habits, and that most of us respond and act out of our conditioning. And again, it, it's a bodhisattva move compassionately and wisely. It's a bodhisattva move to understand that, that the minds of sentient beings are these deeply conditioned things. It, it also lends, it, that lends itself to reading people's minds because many times think, you know, many times the things that we think about, you know, we only have a handful of things to think about usually in a way. You want to talk about a uh, COVID or a stimulus package? You, you know, we got a couple of things and we're all on the same page and there's a way in which we're all conditioned in that way. And so understanding that conditioning. And of course, I want to say this, can't say it enough, the Bodhisattva understands conditioning because they understand that they too are conditioned. So this is not a finger pointing like, ah, yeah, you're conditioned, ha ha. It's about understanding how you work and then being like, oh, all sentient beings are sort of conditioned, attraction averse and confused little beings doing the best we can in this crazy world. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. That's it, I'm gonna call it a day. That's our introduction to Upaya. We will do our proper Upaya list uh, next Sunday. I'm tuning in next Sunday. I don't know about you, but I'll be here. So on that note, thank you all so much for being here. Happy, again, Grand Conjunction, Solstice, Christmas, all, everything. Um, merry, merry, merry. <laughs> <laughs>